My name is Gary Taubes. I'm a co-founder and director of the Nutrition Science Initiative. I'm a journalist, uh, author, and uh, the subject today is the limits of nutritional epidemiology. Uh, I apologize for not being in Denver to give this talk in person. Instead, I'm sitting in my office in Oakland, California, uh, which brings me to my one caveat. Giving a talk to your computer screen is an entirely different phenomenon than giving one in public. The lack of feedback, the inability to make eye contact with your audience or to see who's asleep and who's not, uh, changes the, uh, the experience uh, both for the speaker and the listener profoundly. So uh, with that in mind, uh, let's uh, let's get going and see uh, see what we can do. So, limits of nutritional epidemiology. My conflicts of interest are that I uh, write books on nutrition and health and science. I give lectures and get honorarias for my lectures. And CrossFit and CrossFit Health has been supporting my work lately, for which I am grateful. Now, my background. I've written two major articles on. Nutritional Epidemiology, the first for Science in 1995, and the second uh, New York Times Magazine cover story in 2007. Uh, that article came out the month that my book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, was published. And the reason I wrote it in part was because the results of nutritional epidemiology are in direct conflict with the clinical trials testing uh, the effects of low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets. And uh, so even back in 2007, it was clear that the biggest challenge to the uh, clinical experience of treating people with low carbohydrate diets and to actually the randomized controlled trial evidence were the results coming out of nutritional epidemiology. And I wanted to understand those better. And I had been trying to understand those since 1995, actually earlier, since about 1993 when I first started writing about public health. So circa 2007, that New York Times Magazine article, you could see the track record problem for epidemiology in general, and particularly nutritional epidemiology. And the case study I was using in that article, which I'm going to return to today, is uh, the Nurses' Health Study, which is uh, run out of the Harvard School of Public Health and is the most influential uh, epidemiological survey in the world. So the track record, you've got true positives. You've got the effects where the community in general of epidemiologists and public health scientists think that you have established a, uh, a, a accurate cause and effect uh, relationship without having, actually having to do clinical trials. And that's, uh, smoking and lung cancer, sun exposure and skin cancer and stomach sleeping and sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, I'm less, uh, optimistic about the third, but I, in doing my research for that 2007 story, this, these were the three that, that epidemiologists and public health authorities agreed. I'd almost assuredly been established correctly by these kinds of epidemiologic surveys. And then you had the false positives, the uh, hypotheses that have been generated by these uh, epidemiolo epidemiologic surveys that had not panned out, and there were, they were multiple. Antioxidants uh, didn't prevent heart disease when they were tested in clinical trials. Fiber didn't prevent colon cancer when tested in clinical trials. Hormone replacement therapy did not prevent heart disease when tested in clinical trials, and we'll talk about that at length. Fruits and vegetables did not prevent heart disease when tested in clinical trials. Daily low-dose aspirin didn't prevent colon cancer or heart disease. Folic acid supplements did not prevent colon cancer. So what you're asking in a scenario like this is a benefit when you get it right greater than the risk of this methodology when you get it wrong. Do you save more lives because you reduce smoking and prevent lung cancer and heart disease and reduce sun exposure and prevent skin cancer? Uh, then you lose when you give people advice that turns out to be wrong and maybe hastens their uh, their premature death. And you don't know which is which is the case until you've done the clinical trials that we've discussed.
So the question that we have to ask and that really interests us in this in the, in studying diet and health is this question of whether red and processed meat causes heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and premature mortality, and does saturated fat cause heart disease, diabetes, and premature mortality. Those are the uh, hypotheses generated by these epidemiologic surveys, and the question is, are they correct? Because if they're correct, we're in trouble eating as we do and prescribing the kind of diets that we tend to prescribe. So. I just wanted to give you an example. Observational epidemiology, these surveys are very relatively inexpensive way to do science. And the results invariably are speak to diet and lifestyle and how we live and our health. And that's newsworthy. It's always newsworthy. So one of the things I did in preparation for this talk is I went back through a season's worth of New York Times health news. And now the New York Times is a paper of record. You could expect it to be the most rigorous in what it presents, or at least I expect it to. And going back to the day before Christmas, uh, I could have started January 1st, but I found this study a little more interesting, so I had to include it. Having a dog as a child is tied to a lower risk of schizophrenia as an adult. Um, the reason it fascinated me is I'm a cat lover and there was no significant effect of exposure to cats. And then you get whole milk may be better when it comes to children's weight. Drinking tea is tied to better heart health. Fish oil supplements tied to sperm health. Having children breastfeeding may cut risk of menopause. Eat natto, live longer. Depression may elevate dementia risk. Why fruits and vegetables may lower Alzheimer's risk. The heavier the baby, the fitter the young adult. Excess vitamin B12 may be deadly. Macrol antibiotics early in pregnancy are tied to birth defects. Education may be key for longer life. Heat waves may raise risk of premature. This is all between December 24th and March 12th. Twelfth, vegetarian diet may lower stroke risk, frequent toothbrushing tied to lower diabetes risk. All these studies fall into two categories. Just as a uh, background, there are two types of epidemiologic studies. So there's retrospective studies, retrospective, where you identify cases of the disease. This was done most famously with cigarette smoking and lung cancer. You speak to lung cancer victims. And you compare them to healthy controls, and you see if there's something different in their life. You look backward in time at what might have called the, caused the disease you've identified. And then the second study type are prospective studies, where you identify a large cohort of the population that does not have the disease, ideally does not have the disease. Uh, you survey them for all the aspects of diet and lifestyle that you can think of, and then you follow them forward in time to see who gets the disease and who doesn't, and whether there's some aspect of diet and lifestyle that particularly stands out. Uh, the observation and observational epidemiology, the end product of these studies, are associations between diet, lifestyle, and disease. So having a dog as a child associates with a lower risk of schizophrenia as an adult, whole milk consumption associates with a lower weight of children's weight when they're older, so kids who drank whole milk uh, have a lower risk of being overweight than those who drank low-fat milk. And what you're asking is, is this association representative of cause and effect? In that case, for instance, did the kids who drank whole milk when they were children weigh less than the kids who drank low-fat milk because they drank whole milk? Or are we talking about different types of children in this scenario? And this is what we'll come back to. So before we do, again, we're going to need a brief refresher course on science and method. Um, first step of any scientific uh, Exploration is an observation. You see something, or you observe something, or you create something in your laboratory that ideally uh, is inconsistent with your belief system. And that generates a hypothesis that what you've observed uh, represents some kind of cause and effect relationship. And then you're going to try and create a law based on these cause and effect relationships. And then you test the hypothesis. So that's a simple step. Three steps, observation, hypothesis, and test. 
We usually, we, you know, phrase it as hypothesis and test, but it always begins with an observation. Um, this is how Popper described it, Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, said the method of science is a method of bold conjectures and ingenious attempts to refute them. And the problem is the bold conjectures are easy. They're the hypotheses. Anyone could make one. Here's a hypothesis. Um, space aliens cause obesity by eighth dimensional uh, transformations of uh, lipoprotein lipase. Okay, it's ludicrous, but it's a hypothesis. You could decide if it's bold or not based on your thinking. Um, what's important is whether or not it can be refuted. Um, back to epidemiology, again, what we end up with are associations between diet, lifestyle, and disease. So the reason it's called observational epidemiology is it's because only step one of the process of science. It results only in an observation. And that right there tells you what the limits are. Okay, we could end the talk here, and I'll come back to this slide. What in, nutritional epidemiology gives you is hypothesis generating data, and then those hypotheses have to be tested. Um, when I first wrote about this for science in 1995, epidemiologists still used the phrase hypothesis generating data. They talked about what they found as hypothesis generating data. In fact, there was even an uh, epidemiologist who published a paper that I've been unable to to find 20 years later or 15 years later, in which he had a, uh, in effect, a kind of a roulette wheel that would allow you to generate any a priori hypothesis from any combination of uh, lifestyle factors and disease. So when the epidemiologists did their their research and then claimed to have made an observation, they could claim that that observation concerned. Can, uh, uh, confirmed a pre-existing hypothesis because any pre-existing hypothesis had become possible. Um, often in the press, in the media, and even in articles itself, you see an incorrect version of this association causality issue described. Researchers or reporters will say associations do not necessarily prove causality or associations do not prove causality. The correct version is associations, the logically correct version, associations contain no causal information. Um, and by that I mean there's an infinite possible association, uh, number of associations uh, for any combination of uh, diet, lifestyle, and disease that you might choose. For every disease is an infinite number of possible lifestyle and diet factors that might have caused it. For each diet and lifestyle, there's effectively an uh, infinite number of diseases or uh, effects it could have. And so the existence of an association actually contains no causal information. The question is, can you use it in some way to infer causality? Why can I, why do epidemiologists think they do? So let's just have a brief history lesson. Um, I had this picture to the left on the front of my screen, uh, on the front of the opening slide of my talk. That's the Broad Street Pump. And modern epidemiology begins in 1854 when the British uh, physician John Snow identifies the Broad Street Pump as the uh, apparent source of the epidemic of cholera that is besetting this area of London. And uh, they turn off the pump, and it seems to coincide. They shut down the pump, and it coincides with the cholera epidemic fading away. So the assumption is that he was right about his identification of the pump as the cause, although you never know for sure. You haven't randomized. uh haven't done an experiment in which you took uh, 50 pumps that you thought were causing uh, cholera and turned off 25 of them and ran them and looked to see whether the cholera epidemic vanished uh, in those 25 sites. But you've got a reasonable uh, cause and effect when you turn off the pump and the cholera epidemic goes away, or at least good enough. Um, by the 1950s, this technology is being used to look at rare chronic diseases and particularly smoking and lung cancer. And this is uh, work done by Richard Dow and uh, 
Austin Bradford Hill in the UK, Ernst Winder in the US did similar studies. Again, they looked at uh, cases of lung cancer and compared them to healthy controls and asked what appeared to be the difference. And the answer was cigarette smoking. And the result was by 1964, the famous Surgeon General's report on smoking. And this pretty much convinced epidemiologists that this technology, this methodology of surveying a population and comparing diet and diseases was valuable. And we're going to come back to these numbers. These are the risk factors for heavy smokers, two-pack-a-day smokers versus non-smokers and the increased risk of lung cancer. And you could see that the relative risk increases are dramatic huge, uh, 20 to maybe even 40 in uh, the Dowen Hill study, increased risk of lung cancer if you're a smoker than if you're not. So the epidemiologic swerve that happened here, borrowing from the, the book, The Swerve, is that the research community in the 1950s goes from studying infectious diseases or previously rare diseases like lung cancer to common chronic diseases. And now we're asking the question, instead of what, why is it we have an epidemic of lung cancer, which was a previously rare disease and is getting more and more prevalent, why do we have epidemics? Why is it the number of, uh, the, what's the diet and lifestyle causes of chronic diseases? And the first major study looking at this is the Framingham study in 1962, which produces results suggesting that uh, cholesterol and, again, smoking and blood pressure, high blood pressure, are all risk factors for heart disease. Um, you go from there to the seven countries study and Ansel Keys famous study that has bedeviled our world. And one of the interesting aspects of these studies, I just wanted to cite this out, is as the epidemiologists do this, they're aware of the causality problem. Epidemiologic studies, Ansel Keys writes, alone can rarely, if ever, produce final proof of a causal sequence. And again, he's, they can produce well, we'll discuss it. It can never produce final proof. This is the point. There is no causal information in these associations. But nonetheless, they convince themselves in doing these studies, the idea is they will see something. Ideally, something is as in where the signal is so large as a cigarette's lung cancer study that they can infer causality from it. So as he says, if some of those influences can be identified, however, and facts that alter them discovered, at least some directions prevent, pre preventive efforts would be indicated. So you can see as these methodology moves through time, the researchers begin to convince themselves that they could do for other fields, other diseases, what's been done for lung cancer and infectious diseases. And then in 1976, Frank Spizer, a researcher at Harvard, uh, forms a nurse's health study. And the reason he does it is uh, he's interested in the subject of contraception originally and um, uh, disease uh, risks from birth control. And he chooses nurses as the subjects because they think that by using nurses who are trained uh, an interest in health issues, they'll get a higher response rate and more complete and accurate information when they ask them to fill out surveys. And the surveys they begin to ask them to fill out in 1970, 1980 are these kinds of diet assessments. And you could see that you uh, these have been criticized rightly over the years as almost uh, hopelessly difficult to figure out and understand and providing very uh, inaccurate uh, data. And uh, I actually don't think that's particularly relevant because we're still stuck with the, even if we had perfect data from these surveys, you would still be wrestling with this causality association problem. Um, this is the red meat consumption mortality. This is the highest cited study that the Nurses Health uh, uh, study has published on red meat consumption and mortality. And here's the data we're talking about that we're living with today. And you can see that the risk factors, and this is comparing the heaviest meat eaters to vegetarians. The, they divide up meat eating into quintiles of consumption. So this is a fifth quintile versus the first quintile. 
and the meat eaters have a 1.3% uh, uh, increased risk of dying prematurely, and the unprocessed red meat eaters have a slightly smaller one, and the processed red meat eaters have a slightly smaller one. You put it together, and you get a 1.3 fold increase risk. And the result of this are articles like this, red meat, a ticket to the early grave, Harvard says, death by bacon, says NPR, bad news for red meat lovers, says the Atlantic. So, again, these studies, because they're talking about what we do every day, and our activities every day are fodder for the press and when it comes to red meat they're um too many uh too easy to turn them into headlines like death by bacon i mean that's npr i i listen to npr i may stop someday but so let's go back to the size of the effect this is what we're dealing with this is what this study is about the title remember of my talk is uh the limits of nutritional epidemiology, when did we reach our limits? So how meaningful is this risk? And compared to non-smokers, remember we looked at the cigarette though, that compared to non-smokers, smokers who smoke two packs a day have a 20 to 30 fold increased risk of lung cancer. 20 to 30 fold. And compared to vegetarians, heavy meat eaters have a 0.2 to 0.3 fold increased risk of premature death. So we're looking at an association of one one hundredth the size. And if you think of epidemiology as a signal to noise issue, as it arguably think about all scientific discovery, the signal that we're trying to understand, that we're trying to decide if it's real or not, is one one hundredth the size when we're talking about meat consumption versus smoking. Uh, is it believable? That's the question. I mean, is it believable? Is it believable as a hypothesis, let alone, uh, you know, a, a causal relationship? And then the, the, the key question you're always asking in science, are there alternative explanations other than meat-eating causes death? So this is how Rudolf Virchow, the famous German physiologist, phrased this uh, challenge circa 1847. This was the sort of goal of all scientific endeavors. How can one decide with certainty which of two coexistent phenomena is the cause and which the effect, whether one of them is the cause at all instead of both being effects of a third cause or even whether both are effects of two entirely unrelated causes. And that's what you don't know. All you've seen is the association, the two coexisting phenomena, meat-eating, premature death, or vegetarianism, uh, extended, uh, uh, reduced mortality. All these other questions can't be answered or have not been answered. So when I first wrote about this for science in 1995, I surveyed the epidemiological researchers at the time. And the consensus was an association is worth taking seriously as a hypothesis that the relative risk is greater than three or four and reproducible. Okay, um, Many people said more than three or four, so not 0.2 or 0.3 or 2, but three or four. And the idea was it didn't mean the association was worth was believable as a causal relationship. It was worth taking seriously as a hypothesis that should be or could be checked further. And the idea is anything smaller, and it's just too easy to imagine alternative explanations. So confounders that we're going to discuss. So the question you're asking in a scenario like this, nutritional epidemiology, why might people who eat a lot of meat be very slightly more likely to die prematurely than people who don't? Okay, so one possibility is that meat eating is bad for us and causes heart disease and cancer, in which case the dietary prescriptions that we're giving when we advocate for animal product rich, low carb or ketogenic diets may indeed be mistakes that will shorten people's lives in the long run, regardless of how much um, benefit they may appear to get in the short run. The second possibility is the one that uh, should also be obvious. Maybe people who eat a lot of meat are different than people who don't. Uh, another way to phrase that would be vegetarians are different than meat eaters, and vegans are different than vegetarians and different than meat eaters. Can we consider them the same type of people? And this was described to me once, and I wish I could remember who told me this. And I didn't live uh, adjacent to Berkeley, California, uh, 
when they told me this, but um, they said when you're comparing meat eaters to vegetarians in these kinds of studies, it's like you're comparing the vegetarians who live in Berkeley, California, who go to Chez Panisse, Alice Waters' favorite restaurant for lunch after their yoga practice, to uh, truck drivers from West Virginia whose idea of a night in the town is uh, steak and potatoes and cherry pie and a Coca-Cola at Denny's, and then you're assuming that the difference in their health status is the meat. And maybe the difference is everything else about their lives. And that's what we mean when we talk about confounders. And this is why randomization is necessary. Okay, The reason you do a clinical trial is you don't have these problems. If you randomize your subjects to meat-eating or vegetarian diets or heavy meat versus less meat or bacon versus non-bacon, you're assuming that by randomizing your your as best as can be established, making sure that the two different groups that you're studying have the same characteristics. When you're doing a, an epidemiologic survey, you can never satisfy that because you're never randomizing. So you're dealing, as soon as you pick different aspects of life to study vegetarians versus meat eaters, there's a large, a high probability that you're studying different types of people and that the differences you see in their health can be explained by something other than what you're focused on, which in this case would be meat eating. So these are known as confounders in epidemiologic uh, science. And the one way to think of them, the way I think of them, they're just plausible alternative explanations for the associations observed. They're less interesting because they're not implicating diet and lifestyle. They're saying that there's something about how you did the observation that biased it in such a way that you saw something that was spurious. So the common bias in this case is known as healthy user bias. Um, the idea is people who make an effort to care about their health are different from those who don't, not just healthier, but wealthier and wiser and who knows what else. And they engage in other health conscious behaviors that are not being measured. So in the case of meat eating, what you would assume and what I do assume is that when you go back to the 1970s, when this nurse's health study, for instance, was started, um, mostly plant diets are already being advocated as good for your health, and vegetarian diets are always considered more sort of somehow inherently healthier by a certain uh, health-conscious type of people. So maybe the people who chose to eat vegetarian diets and mostly plant diets beginning in the 1970s were inherently healthier. Just the same way people who, for instance, drink more water might be healthier than those who don't, or people who exercise might be more health conscious than those who don't, or people who avoid eating red meat in the 1970s would be healthier than those who don't, or more health conscious than those who don't, because they're aware, they're reading the health news, they're paying attention to what the experts say, and they're acting on it, and they would do this in a lot of other ways as well. So, for instance, in my apologies, I tend to think of my mother as an example. She was health conscious in the 1960s and 70s, and she raised us this way, so we didn't have sodas in the house, and we didn't have fruit, uh, we didn't have uh, canned fruits in the house, and we ate cereals like Product 19 because she thought they were healthier, and we didn't, weren't allowed to eat sugary cereals, and those weren't kept in the house, and we also limited our red meat consumption because she believed red meat causes colon cancer. Uh, we went to the doctors regularly. We went to the dentist regularly. We were, you know, uh, allowed, uh, promoted to, to exercise regularly. All a whole slew of health conscious behaviors that cluster together. And the question is, when you're measuring a study like this, you don't know which is which is true, which is the the causal effect. And then another, more even more insidious bias, an adherence or compliance bias. So. People engage in health conscious behaviors are healthier, tend to be more health conscious in general than people who don't, but people make a concerted effort in these health conscious behaviors are even more different. And this is a fascinating uh, phenomenon, the adherer bias, and it comes out of originally uh, a study of uh, a cholesterol lowering drug that was done in the 1970s, a coronary drug research uh, 
project, and it was a randomized controlled trial of a drug, a cholesterol-lowering drug called clofibrate, and everyone had, the researchers had great uh, expectations that this would lower heart disease deaths, but when they looked at the final results, they saw that it didn't. The uh, clofibrate group and the uh, the placebo group had uh, roughly the same amount of deaths in it. So what they thought to themselves is clofibrate was a, a, a difficult drug to literally swallow, and they thought maybe uh, the problem is they weren't getting great adherence to the uh, to the use of clo clofibrate. So maybe if they only looked at the people who actually took the drug, they would get a more realistic view of the drug's benefit, which makes a lot of sense. So they looked at uh, adherers and compared adherers, uh, the ones who actually took the drug, to the placebo group. And now you see that clofibrate appears to bestow a benefit. But then they thought, wait, 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 maybe just to make sure that our trial is not biased, we should compare the people who faithfully took clofibrate to the people who faithfully took the placebo. And now you see that even the people who took, faithfully took the placebo are healthier than the group at large. They have a lower death rate and uh, significantly lower than the non-adherers. They taking the placebo regularly appears to be associated with a almost 50% reduction in um, heart disease. And your conclusions are, first of all, clofibrate clearly bestows no benefit, and adherers are fundamentally different than non-adherers. People who follow health advice and act on health advice and do it regularly for whatever reason, and you don't know why, that's the interesting thing. We don't know why, but for whatever reason, they're healthier. And they're healthier in a lot of different ways. And again, you can take care of that by randomizing your subjects between intervention and control, but we don't randomize in observational studies. So the last <coughs> major issue here, which wraps all of these together, they're all related to socioeconomic status. Um, maybe people who choose to be vegetarians have a different socioeconomic status than people who don't. Uh, in fact, it's somewhat difficult, and you could argue it's a bit of a luxury to be able to be a vegetarian. Um, you have to have time to cook the food. You have to be very selective about you, the way you eat. In the same way, it's a bit of a luxury to, to eat a ketogenic diet regularly. Um, so maybe what you're seeing in these studies is due to socioeconomic status. The um, Socioeconomic status in health is, is, a, is a remarkable phenomenon. So this is the most highly cited paper in the field um, documenting this, written by a group of uh, psychologists in 1994. And you can see the large difference in mortality rate between high socioeconomic status on the left of this chart and low on the right. And here's morbidity rate by socioeconomic status. So there's a very steep difference. And the way this was described to me by uh, uh, epidemiologists is that misfortunes also tend to cluster together, just as health-conscious behaviors tend to cluster together, misfortunes cluster together. So when you're poor, you have higher stress, you live in uh, less safe environments, you have greater uh, air pollution in your environments, um, you've got uh, less access to physicians, you've got less time to care about health conscious behavior because you're working harder and maybe multiple jobs, your jobs aren't as safe, your working conditions aren't as safe, the foods you can afford aren't as fresh and aren't as quote healthy unquote however that we define it. So you've got a whole slew of, uh, of variables that cluster together with socioeconomic status and the key question you would want to know in any study is to make sure that you've controlled for socioeconomic status. And again, nutritional epidemiology can't do that because they don't randomize their subjects. So social class, as these researchers said, is among the strongest known predictors of illness and health and yet is paradoxically a variable about which very little is known. Now, Let's do a case study here. This is the one I used in 2007, and it's actually not about nutrition. 
the nurse's health study and hormone replacement therapy. But the reason hormone replacement therapy is such a good case study instead of, say, red meat or bacon is because it should be easy to get this right. Okay, uh, you should be able to maximize your signal to noise ratio because you could identify who's taking hormone replacement therapy a lot easier and for how long they took it a lot easier than you could how much meat people eat or how many vegetables they eat or what kind of meat they eat. Uh, Jamie Robbins, a uh, professor of epidemiology at Harvard, one of my favorite epidemiologists, the way he phrased this to me, he said, for something as easy as HRT, where the confounding is not horrible, maybe you can get it right. And if you can't, that's the key, if you can't get this right, meaning you could infer a causal relationship between hormone replacement therapy and the presence or absence of a disease state, why would you possibly think you could do it for diet? So the Nurses' Health Study in 1978 um, begins to ask about female hormones. Remember, this study was founded by Frank Spicer originally to look at contraceptive use, but by 1978, uh, hormone replacement therapy was beginning to be a, an interesting issue. Uh, and so they asked in their 1978 survey, they asked the nurses, do you use female hormones? And since June 1976, when the study starts, have you used it? <coughs> in 1979, um, Elizabeth Barrett Connor publishes the results of a, a cohort study she's been doing in a, in a, a, a suburb outside of San Diego and reports that the risk of death from estrogen users uh, is almost a third that of non-users. So there's a, a what appears to be a very large signal uh, from... Uh, benefit of using HRT, and that's not trivial. That's not a 1.3, 1.2 relative risk. That's a 0.37 relative risk. Um, the non-users have a three, uh, a three times greater risk of um, premature death. Uh, in 1985, seven years after asking the question, the Harvard researchers, led by Mayor Stamfer, uh, for the first time published their results, and they confirm what Barrett Connor has seen. Um, the relative risk among those who had ever used the hormone replacement therapy of heart disease was one half of what it was of non-users, and the risk in current users was less than a third. Again, a, what seems to be uh, a very large effect. So this is big news, and um, there's the data itself. You could see current versus never users, past versus never users. Um, total coronary heart disease is dramatically reduced. And they begin to see this once again as a causal effect. They've, they've done this survey. They, they're aware of the association causality problem, but the reason you do these studies, you go through all this trouble, the reason you do the research is because you want to be able to imply that you're seeing a causal relationship and then recommend that the public change their behavior accordingly. And as they talk about it, so the way they phrase it, you could see this bias has crept in. Further work is needed to define the optimal type, dose, and duration of post-hormone menopausal hormone use and to determine whether to add progestin. So further work isn't needed to test the hypothesis. They already believe this hypothesis is true based on their very first study, and in part because it's such a large effect. Um, 1991, they published the 10-year data. They see the same thing. The consistency, now they're saying the consistency of the epidemiologic data is such that it all suggests a causal association between estrogen use and a reduced risk of heart disease. Again, further work is needed to identify who's going to benefit most, what kind of hormone therapy, but they believe this is true. And as far as the Harvard people are concerned, they've, they've confirmed a pre-existing hypothesis that they see as hypothesis and test, even though it's the same type of data, the same type of study. Um, what about the experiments that actually test the hypothesis? So luckily, the Harvard School of Public Health people are not yet running the world of uh, public health 
and preventive medicine, although they're getting close. Um, clinical trials in this case are actually done that test the hypothesis. The first is published in 1998. It's the HERS study, and the result is, at that time, paradoxically, that the hormone replacement therapy did not reduce the overall rate of death, and the treatment increased the rate of stroke and gallbladder disease. So this is worrisome. And then in 19, uh, excuse me, 2001, the uh, Women's Health Initiative results are published. This is a study of 16,000 women, um, randomized. Uh, it's a randomized controlled trial, and the result is overall health risks exceeded benefits. So the Observational studies were showing one-third uh, the heart disease in users of hormone replacement therapy compared to non-users. Um, the clinical trials, the tests of those hypotheses, the real tests of those hypotheses, um, are publishing, are finding something different. So they refute the hypothesis. And you could see here the... Um, uh, hormone therapy is the thin line, the placebo is a big line, and for heart disease, stroke, uh, pulmonary embolism, breast cancer, uh, the hormone replacement therapy appears to have caused more disease than the placebo. And a couple of examples, colorectal cancer and hip fracture, you see the other. But in general, you're seeing more damage, more uh, risk to taking these hormones and benefits. Uh, to these women. So this is huge news. Um, front page New York Times on uh, July 9th, uh, 2002, and then uh, um, a follow-up story on July 10th. The rigorous study found that the drugs caused small increase in breast cancer, heart attacks, excuse me, heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots. Those risks outweigh the drug's benefit. A shock to the medical system is the follow-up um, headline. So what happened? That's the question. Who's right? Um, did the observational studies get it right? Was the hypothesis right despite the test? That's always possible. I mean, again, you could screw up the test. Uh, one of the reasons why today uh, major public health figures... Uh, Tom Frieden, former head of the CDC, and uh, Walt Willett, who's a, the principal investigator of the Women Nurses Health Study, is argue for uh, making uh, public health recommendations based on observational epidemiologies because they don't believe the clinical trials can be tested, and they didn't believe this clinical trial asked the right question. Um, this was by Mayor Stamfer, so when you're asking what's the why what happened here one possibility is that the studies asked two different types of questions so the observational studies were asking the question what happens when women take hormone replacement therapy beginning with menopause and finding that it reduces heart disease risk and when you look at the way the randomized controlled trials were done they actually uh, two-thirds of the subjects were actually over 60 years old, so they were asking the question, what happens when older women past menopause start taking hormone replacement therapy? So maybe they got different answers because they asked different questions. The Harvard group still thinks that this is a correct interpretation of the data, and they could be right, but you need randomized control trials to test that hypothesis because it's only a hypothesis. The less preferred explanation is that these studies are incapable of determining cause and effect. They can only generate hypotheses because they're not randomized, and there are so many differences even in a uh, issue like hormone replacement therapy between users and non-users and current users and past users that you can't interpret the data correctly. So when you see even as parent on a large effect as in this case with a third the heart disease in current users versus non-users that could easily be caused by the biases and confounders in the study. So prescriber bias, doctors, physicians who prescribe hormone replacement therapy might preferentially prescribe it to women who they perceive consciously or subconsciously as healthier. Um, the healthy user bias, we've 
which we've discussed, the adherer bias, which we've discussed. There's another one, migration bias, where it's possible that the women who decide to take hormone replacement therapy over the course of the study or who move from being users to non-users are have some kind of difference in their health status that isn't doesn't isn't reflected in the survey information and then the socioeconomic status issue and the reason i bring up the socioeconomic status issue is by the 1980s this pursuit of observational epidemiology was being heavily criticized in the literature the criticism themselves were then criticized by epidemiologists and even epidemiologists who would agree with most of the criticisms. It's a fascinating phenomenon that I've yet to quite make sense of. But Alvin Feinstein, who was a leading critic in the 1980s, a very controversial character in this field, he did was a Yale uh, epidemiologist. He wrote uh, authored textbooks on epidemiology. He also took money from the cigarette industry. Um, he is, uh, I have epidemiologic friends who don't think I should ever quote him. They think me quoting uh, Alvin Feinstein would be like them quoting uh, Ansel Keys. As a, but nonetheless, I agree with his criticisms. And the greatest one was his apparent complacency about fundamental methodological flaws. This was an article he wrote in Science. It was a follow-up. He had written an earlier one for the New England Journal of Medicine on the problems with epidemiology. And he said, in other branches of science, substantial distress would be evoked by conflicting results in different studies. Authorities would clamor for special conferences or workshops intended to identify the methodologic defects and to institute suitable repairs. No such clamor and no such workshops have occurred. And when I got into writing about epidemiology in 1993, 94, 95, was because I was stunned a, by the apparent methodological flaws in how it was done, but more than that, the fact that the researchers themselves didn't particularly seem to care that they were doing what, to me, was completely substandard science. That was always my bias. So HRT and socioeconomic status in the nurses, think of this as a case study in this complacency issue. Um, Social class is among the strongest known predictors of illness and health. This is what we talked about. The Nurses Health Study publishes its first results on hormone replacement therapy in 1985. And in 1987, Diana Petiti at the University of California, actually Kaiser Permanente Medical Center down the road from me in Oakland, is doing a uh, cohort study in Walnut Creek, which is another 10 miles west of us, east of us, and uh, non-contraceptive estrogens, and she sees very much the same thing in her study that the Nurses Health Study had published and that Elizabeth Barrett Connor had published from the San Diego group. But then she sees something else as well. She says of the lower mortality, a reduced risk of accidents and homicides and suicide in the estrogen users, it's as small as a reduced risk from heart disease. So you think about this, a lower mortality from accident, suicide, and homicide in estrogen users has no plausible biologic explanation. And the observation suggests that lifestyle differences between estrogen users and non-users account at least in part for their lower mortality. So by 1987, you've got researchers talking about the possibility that even in this nurses group, there's something profoundly different between the users and the non-users, and it's lifestyle differences and maybe even socioeconomic status. And in 2002, this was wrapped up in a research project, uh, uh, a meta-analysis done by Harold Sox and Cowling. Sox was the um, uh, editor at the time of Animal Annals of Internal Medicine and a major figure in evidence-based medicine. He said further analyses of studies adjusting for socioeconomic status as well as other major heart disease risk factors show a summary relative risk of 1.07. This study was actually done before the Women's Health Initiative came out. Um, so they saw a higher risk of heart disease in um, hormone replacement users and uh, this suggested confounding and uh, 
markedly different relative risks depending on the inclusion or exclusion of socioeconomic status or education. They also pointed out all the other possible biases that could explain uh, a, a bogus reduced risk of disease in women who took hormone replacement therapy. Um, these findings are important because randomization is the only way to deal with the inherent biases in observational studies. Okay, so what did the nurses' health study? How did they respond to this? So to Sox's articles, they used what they is uh, basically the central dogma now of the nurses' health study. All our participants are registered nurses with nearly identical education. The implication being that they have you're controlling for socioeconomic status by choosing nurses. And as early as the late 1980s, researchers were pointing out that nurses can have vastly different socioeconomic status depending on what their husbands do if they're married. So a nurse who's married can be married to the CEO of a corporation, and some of them were. And nurses can be single mothers with five children to raise who are working, you know, two jobs. And you're going to have a vastly different uh, socioeconomic status between the two. And you can't just say that it's all the same, which the nurses, by the way, still does. So what about the complacency issue? Um, 1989, just for completeness, they started a second nurses' health study, um, a younger group of um, patients. Remember, the first the hormone replacement therapy date is in 1985. In 1987, their researchers are suggesting that what they're seeing is an artifact of lifestyle differences and socioeconomic status differences. Five years after that, in, in the first uh, cohort, they asked the first questions about unemployment and education. Nothing you could really use to establish socioeconomic status, but at least they're asking about um, uh, education because the assumption is that a, a a uh, nurse with a bachelor's degree or a nurse with a doctorate or a nurse who's married versus a nurse who's widowed or never married will have different socioeconomic status. And they asked this question about the highest level of education your husband completed, assuming that education can be a proxy maybe for socioeconomic status and wealth. Um, 1999, they asked that question again, so we're now 14 years out from the first results. 2000, they ask about community standing, which is basically how you see your status in the U.S. and the community. So it's a way, an indirect way, to approach this question of socioeconomic status. And 2001, they finally ask about it. So now we're 16 years out. They ask about income, and it's an optional question. So it doesn't have to be answered. And it's interesting, if you think about these studies from the perspective, as I have, of uh, Willett and Spicer and Stamfer and the researchers who embarked on this project in um, the late 1970s. In effect, this was a new methodology, like a, a new device to detect what they hoped would be causal relationships between diet, lifestyle, and disease. And in 1979, without really thinking it through, because they haven't had the opportunity to think it through, and they haven't had the critical assessment from their peers to think it through, they launched this um, massive project. And in 1985, they think they, think they see a signal. So this is like physicists uh, publishing the apparent discovery of a new particle. And they think their detector technology, which is the um, the nurses' health survey itself, these 120,000 nurses have allowed them to discover this new causal relationship, this new fundamental law between diet and health. And then beginning in 1987, once they've published the results, the rest of the community can now criticize it. And so you have people like Petiti and Barrett Connor and others saying, wait, what about this? Maybe socioeconomic status isn't a factor. Maybe you can't assume all the nurses have the same socioeconomic status. Maybe our results show that the lifestyle is playing a huge role. Maybe there's healthy user bias. So you're now eight years into a project, and now you're finally being made aware of all the ways you could screw up, all the ways that your technology or methodology can fool you. And what do you do about it? Now, in an ideal world, you methodically go through each one of these and assess it. Is this a factor? And then you publish the analysis. And as 
Feinstein and other critics pointed out, in an ideal world you would have workshops where your critics would come and you would all discuss this because there's nothing more important than getting it right. And none of this happens in epidemiology. None of this happens with the nurse's health study. Um, in this case, I could find one study ever done which compared, actually used the socioeconomic status that they had gathered. There were no workshops. There were no conferences. There were no inviting their critics or skeptics in that, I can promise you. The reason I underline the date on this, February 6, 2007, is because I did that. My story for the New York Times Magazine came out in September 2007, and I was reporting it all through the spring and summer. And I was working closely with Mayor Stamfer uh, at Harvard on this, and the mayor kept saying that the socioeconomic status analysis had been done. And I would ask him for references, and he would send me in a fact check with the New York Times. We would get references from him. And we would pull the reference from the journal, and we would read the reference. And invariably, it might mention that there was no apparent effect from socioeconomic status, but it wouldn't show any analysis. And then it would reference another paper. So then we would get the other paper, and that might have a clause or a sentence saying there's no effect from socioeconomic status in the nurse's study, and that would reference a third paper, and it was like Russian dolls. The more we went down, the less never found it, and then we would go back to Dr. Stamford and we would say, you know, we didn't find the analysis, can you try somewhere else? And then he would send another paper in the same reference, and I end up in the article saying that no apparent analysis had been done, and I was wrong. And why Stanford didn't know this is interesting, I also underlined the authors on this article. He's not an author. Walter Willett is not an author. Frank Spicer is not an author. Um, Frank Hugh and Joanne Manson. Joanne was involved with the um, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, Frank had recently, he joined in the late 90s. Um, none of the principal investigators were authors on this study. Achiro Kawachi, the last uh, uh, author, was a Harvard uh, School of Public Health uh, professor who was interested in socioeconomic status, and they look at the question of socioeconomic status and type 2 diabetes in women. And what's interesting is they look at these questions we saw they asked. So when you look at father's occupation in childhood, you see a small effect. When you look at husband's education, high school versus graduate school, you start to see a large effect. And I'm showing only age adjusted, because once you start adjusting for body mass index also in multivariates, you start confounding it with the, the assumption is that those aren't related to socioeconomic status, and they may be also. So now you start to see large effects, even just on diabetes. Um, this is uh, according to combined childhood and adult socioeconomic status. So I'm assuming they used the income data that they asked in 2001. This is a 2007 paper, but they don't actually specify. And again, you're seeing a pretty large effects, um, at least related to um, changing uh, socioeconomic status. And again, I don't even know how they established a change in socioeconomic status, because as far as I could tell, they only asked about income once. Okay, so conclusion about national health, uh, no, no, uh, the uh, should be the um, nurse's health study, HRT and socioeconomic status. No one knows, because they never gathered the necessary data. No published analyses can be found. And the Complacency, compliancy, that should say complacency issue, is that um, I don't think they care. Or they looked and they found something they didn't like and none were published. Um, the limits of nutritional epidemiology, the conclusion, the reason it's called observational epidemiology, I showed this slide earlier. These are the limits. All it produces is an ob observation and association between diet, lifestyle, and disease. If the association, if the signal is as huge as it is for cigarettes and lung cancer, we believe it without a randomized controlled trial because we can't imagine any other way to explain it. Uh, once signals get below a relative risk of 5 or even 10, 
There are all too many ways to explain it. Now you're down in the noise of all these confounders and biases, and without randomized controlled trials, all you've got is the hypothesis generating data. And then a last point, in the 21st century, people have started criticizing this since 2005. The most prominent is John Ioannidis. Um, he wrote this article in, in uh, 2018, two years ago, claiming, saying the field needs radical reform. Uh, there's, again, the emerging picture of nutritional epidemiology is difficult to reconcile with good scientific principles. It has always been difficult to reconcile with good scientific principles. The problem is while you have critics, I put together this Venn diagram, on the right are nutritional epidemiologists, and then the critics, this tiny number of methodologists who critique nutritional epidemiology, and they apparently have no effect on the way the epidemiology is done because the epidemiologists are committed. They're committed to a methodology that's fatally flawed, that's at odds with the existing scientific principles. And um, if they acknowledge that, they're out of work. It's a hard thing to acknowledge that what you've been doing for 5, 10, 20 years, even just as your doctoral thesis, is a flawed methodology that you know, fundamentally cannot establish a causal relationship between diet, lifestyle, and disease. Thank you. Uh, it's been an interesting experience, and uh, I hope uh, Denver and low-carb Denver turns out to be great for everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, Greg Rod, thank you for letting me play a role.